All right, so let's uh, let's look at um, at Deuteronomy sixteen sixteen. This talks about all of the three festivals. The three festivals uh, in which you um, had to be in Jerusalem when the temple stood. Three times a year, all of your males shall appear before the Lord, your God, at the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of uh, Passover, Pesach, of weeks, Shavuot, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And that is actually when they do, do their tithes too, but the message is about the three, well, most of all the third one, Sukkot, but about the three festivals. Deuteronomy 16, 16. The three-stage strategy to V-Day, Victory Day. So lift me up in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to talk about, first of all, Passover, Pesach, where the budget is covered up front. It's paid for. When Yeshua declared, it is finished, the war for your redemption was won. When he said it is finished, that meant the adversary was defeated. That meant the, 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 the ability for God to justly forgive you was accomplished. When Yeshua had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit, his spirit. Yochanan 19, 30. At that point, we count the cost in our lives. We do count the cost. But he paid the price. You might want to write that down or you might want to try to remember it. We count the cost in our lives. But he paid the price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And this has to do with the Passover theme of the redemption through the blood of the Lamb. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from God? It's, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. He, we count the cost. He paid the price, but he, but he uh, I mean, we count the cost, but he paid the price. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The budget is covered up front for your redemption. It's free in that sense. And I know that when I accepted Messiah, immediately the connection was made and the presence of God came down and the Spirit of God entered my life. And that is a connection that happens every time everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Hashem, and understands, you know, that concept and receives him into their lives shall be saved. Then, speaking about V-Day and the theme of a battle or a war that is won, the occupation begins, so to speak, on Shavuot. The real work starts after the initial victory of God taking up occupation, occupying uh, in our lives, and us occupying, being the force that comes in and occupies in the place of the defeated foe. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom to, and return, to receive for himself. That's where the victory came. He received that. It was bought for a price. He won the battle. He received the kingdom, and he returned. So he called ten of his servants and delivered to them ten minas, the a coin, and said to them, occupy or do business, doing his business, occupying the territory. This is that period of time represented by, by uh, Shavuot when the Spirit was poured out, when God began the equipage of the body of believers to represent him and be his body on earth. And that victory 
And then in that context, we are the champions. We are the, we are the conquerors. We are the overcomers who overcome and conquer through the love of God. That's our, that's really our, our weaponry, our tool for the victory in life is the love of God. Because love overcomes all things. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13. Love of God never fails. If you've heard it said, Matthew 5, 43, 45, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And if you can't, you know, you can't get any traction with those. And the, the last one, it says, you can, if none of those things, if you're not able to uh, have that access and do that good uh, to those who hate you, the least you can do it. Or not the least, but the finally, you can pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, which Yeshua did on the tree. You can pray for those. He spoke to the Father about those that were opposing him, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. There's no conflict there with the Torah, but there's nothing quite like it in terms of it has been said, but let me say this to you, in terms of how it's expressed either. It's really, yes, in the continuity of what God had intended, but the perfect saying of it had never been expressed in that clear a sense. Love your brother, your neighbor as yourself, yes, but he says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, Pray for those who spitefully use you. Every one of those words is spoken purposely by the Mashiach. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. And think about that. Yes, there will be justice. There will be judgment. But God, in this earth, where we live on, makes the sun rise on the good and the evil. Sends rain on the just and the unjust. He blesses those who curse him. In this earth, in this world, as we live in it now. This is what God has said. That's where big things begin. The real work starts. Shavuot represented there after the initial victory. And the concept in Romans 5, 15, then the Spirit of God. I, I, love, I love this uh, scripture uh, from Romans 5. there, but it's thought I had it there. And it's coming just a there okay, here it is. Now hope, 5-5, five, five. hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out on our hearts by the Ruach HaKodesh. In our hearts by the Ruach HaKodesh it was given to us. So it's the love of God that's poured out by the Ruach HaKodesh. As he is poured out, it is the love of God that we are to walk in and we are, we are to uh, follow through with. You shall love your en- you shall you shall love your enemies and bless those who curse you. So think about that right now. What is the person you find it most difficult to get along with or that you've had the most difficult situation? Yeshua tells you, and that's what the Spirit of God has given for you in its primary sense, to love those who are even cursing you. To love those who are coming against you. The scripture is very clear about that. In that passage from, from the what's called the Sermon on the Mount. So that's what we do during this period of time, so to speak, after uh, he, the initial victory of Messiah's resurrection and death and resurrection. That's what we do. That's what we do 
is we occupy, as he says there, or the word in the Greek can be to do business in this world, to do his business in this world until he returns. That's what we do. And then finally the king returns to rule and to reign over the earth in that thousand year reign and then beyond that in the new heavens and new earth. He will come through the gate that is prepared for him called the Sha'arei Harachamim, the gate of loving kindness or the golden gate. The golden gate that is just uh, where the Mount of Olives is just um, east of the Mount of Olives. Sha'arei Harachamim. Closed since Suleiman the Great, or whatever you want to call him, the Islamic ruler, many centuries ago, 13th, 15th century, who knew the Jewish people were expecting the Messiah to come through that gate, and therefore he sealed it up, and it remains sealed to this day. When you go to Israel, and you're on the Mount of Olives, and you look across the Valley of Kidron, and you see the golden gate there in the Mount of Olives, the Sha'arei Arachamim, and you see that it's closed, it is sealed up. Because he knew the scripture in Ezekiel 44, 1 to 3, then they brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary. This is, uh, many people feel like it's a millennial temple they're talking about, which faces toward the east, but it was shut. The gate was shut. And the Lord said, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no man shall enter by it because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. And I believe that's referring to Yeshua coming through that gate. Therefore, it shall be shut. As for the prince, he may sit and eat bread there. It is shut, the gate. And it has been shut. And it's sealed today. You can see that. But the Messiah will come through that gate. How many are thankful for that? It's a gate that is prepared for the Messiah. I firmly believe that. That's why the country of Israel is so relevant today. He comes down on the Mount of Olives, which I'm going to quote in a second. He touches down there. It's a, it's a mount that exists to this day. You go and you see it. There, are, there is a cemetery uh, on there because there was a view and a perspective that the Messiah would come there first. So there's an Orthodox cemetery there um, and, um, and so forth. Let me just read about Yeshua's touchdown. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Oz. This is Zechariah 14, 3 and 4. This is not from the, t the New Covenant. This is from Zechariah. And his, the Lord's feet, yud heh vav -Hey, the Lord, the Lord, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now, nobody even knew that there was a fault on the Mount of Olives until 1964. Listen to what I'm saying here now, okay? People were not aware that there was this major fault running east to west on the Mount of Olives until 1964. Now, what happened in 19... Well, a lot of things happened in 1964, but it was discovered in 1964 when King Hussein wanted to build the Seven Arches Hotel and was preparing to do that, and and uh, the the uh, site planners found out there that there was this there was this fault there, and so east of the mount, and so they moved they moved in the mount, 
and they moved the, the site of the hotel south intentionally in order to make sure that tremors and other things from this possible earthquake would not take lives or kill anybody. This was King Hussein of Jordan who built the Seven Arches Hotel intentionally south of where that would have been because he realized that the fault was there. People did not know until 1964 that that fault, clearly know that that fault existed like they did, you know, after that. And yet the scripture clearly sees in the direction which it would be from the east to west, the scripture clearly indicates that when the Messiah touches down, that's when that earthquake will occur in which it says that it shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley and living water will pour forth from other scriptures. And, uh, and so this is, this is what the scripture has to say. This is, this is clearly indicated in, in the Bible. So we have this moving into the period represented by Sukkot, which is Zechariah 14, is, is definitely the theme of the millennium and Sukkot, Zechariah 14, which I just quoted, and the rest of the chapter, talking about that period of time. I believe in a 7,000-year reign of Messiah on earth. And, and it's so it, it seems it clearly indicates from my, my point of view that this is Yeshua's touchdown. So the three-stage strategy starts represented by Passover in his redemption, Shavuot in the Occupy, you know, situation, which uh, is not like the modern political one, but Yeshua said, Occupy until I come in which the body of believers represents him on earth and the spirit of God is active in the earth through the body. And then finally, you have, and that's represented by Shavuot, so Passover, these are the three holidays you had to be in Jerusalem. Passover, Shavuot, and then finally Sukkot. The king returns. The valley, uh, the, the, the mountain splits in two. The Messiah comes and reigns and rules on earth and over the 12 tribes of Jacob. And that is, that is the third of the three holidays that you had to, festivals that you had to be in Jerusalem. And the last of them in the fall, the other two are in the spring, I believe, that represent the atonement of Messiah, the outpouring of the Spirit on the body. And then finally you have the, the, the fall one after, of course, the High Holy Days is Sukkot. And this is the time that represents Mashiach's second coming, first coming being represented in the first, in the spring festivals, now in the fall festivals, representing the second coming. Now, does that mean the Messiah is going to come back on Sukkot? I mean, I can't say that. And other people have opinions about what they, they believe the scripture points to. I don't know. And I'm not going to take a hazard or a guess to say I know for sure. But I do know. I do know that there is a prophetic connection. That there is a thematic connection there with Sukkot and the reign of Messiah on earth. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem, a real, literal place called the Mount of Olives. And it will be split in two. They didn't know there was a fault that runs in that direction through it. The one described here where it says this shall be split in two from east to west, which is literally where the fault goes it is actually where the fault is actually actually kept 
commercial concerns and a nation from building right there because they found it. They knew it existed. They realized it was unstable for that particular for that particular purpose and to use in that way. So the stage is set. Yeshua is coming soon. The stage is set. Hairpin trigger. What will it take to set it off? Well, it seems like it's the second coming that's going to take it to set it up. Landing zone on earth of the Messiah. I take these things literally, and I recognize that it's important for us to think not only about his first coming, not only about the life we live on earth here, but, you know, as it says in, in, in Shimon, Peter, you know, it's a thousand days is, years is, is a day, and a day is a thousand years, but it's not going to last forever. You look at him, Shimon, he's talking there not only about this particular experience, but as we move into the future with, uh, you know, with the, the earth shall be burned up and so forth. And these things are all in the scripture. What sort of people, Shimon Peter said, ought we to be, seeing that things will end in this way? We live for the Lord. We live for the Lord. But we're not looking at Second Peter now. But it's amazing to look at this scripture from Zechariah 14, 3 and 4, about, about landmarks that exist today that have the vulnerability that's described here. Nobody knew it back then. Every time you go to Israel, you visit, you see the Mount of Olives, Valley of Kidron, and uh, all the things that are there, you realize it is certainly a place that God has 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 um, raised up and that has a purpose. The return of Israel, the Jewish people to Israel, all these things have a purpose. They have their prophetic fulfillment. There's dozens of places in the Tanakh and the New Covenant as well. You say in the New Covenant, yes, Jerusalem will be trodden down uh, by the Gentiles, by the nations, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Luke 21, 24, yes, the Tanakh and the New Covenant all talking about the return of Israel, even in Acts 1, where, where uh, you know, it says there, um, where Yeshua says uh, concerning these things, um, uh, it says, is this the time and season, you know, that these things are going to happen and that the day of your return? And uh, Yeshua speaks to the disciples about that. And um, he said, uh, he says, it is not for you to know. He says that this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel, come back and reign. It is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. You know, these things happen in God's in God's season. But you shall receive power when the Rach Hakodesh comes upon you, and that's what we were just talking about. This concept of Shavuot representing the, 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 the Messiah's finished work and the relevance upon the body of believers in the world. You shall be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's that period of time we were talking about represented by Shavuot. And he's actually referring to Shavuot there when he talks about the Spirit of God being poured out on them. And then, of course, uh, Sukkot. So Passover... Shavuot, seven weeks later, we talked about the relevance of Passover and his redemption. Shavuot and the equipping of the body. And then Sukkot. Sukkot. The Lord will come and stand, come to the Mount of Olives. Sukkot, representing then that period of time where he reigns on earth and the harvest that he is looking to bring forth 
of, 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 of human beings that are being raped even this day. Thank you, Lord, for this time, for this message, for this service, for your presence with us. Thank you for the Lulav and Etrog and what they represent, the wonderful ability for us to rejoice, Isaiah 12, 3, to rejoice with great joy. We will rejoice uh, the living water that he provides. Therefore, with joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation. A wonderful Sukkot verse from Isaiah 12, verse 3. Amen? All right, let's rise. We're going to close with some worship.